This is Rudo Radio coming to you from the 559. Hello and welcome to Rudo Radio, SB Nation, and Cage Shite Seats, somewhat weekly podcast. I am Nick Bond, joined as usual by Mr. Mark Normandon. Mark, how are you? Well, we're recording, so I guess that's probably, you know, good. No stress this week about being in a different part of the country or you not having power, which, come on, Nick, get stronger power lines or something. I don't know. I don't know how that stuff <laughs> Yeah, I... Uh... Oh, and uh, the, the, the laughter you hear is my friend David, who we'll meet in a minute, but I did want to explain, uh, last week, a tree fell down the block from my house and took out a power line, so I had no power for, like, eight hours, uh, which was, like, five days after I had gotten into a car accident and totaled my car, so I had had quite a couple of days. Uh, I am totally fine, my car is not, but uh, we've moved on, everything's good, and we should be good going forward. Um Including this week, we should be extra good because we have a guest, Wrestle Delphia and Hofstra University's own David Gibb. David, oh. <laughs> how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. Dave and I went to college <laughs> together, and he, uh, but he also, more importantly, writes for Wrestle Delphia, which is the 18th. Is it 18th? I think uh, uh, highest rated. 18th or 19th? I'll take 18th though, because that one's better. Best wrestling website on the internet, so that's good. And uh, you. Focus mostly on NXT, which we'll be talking about later, but we'll start with uh, Raw, um, which was... <laughs> not excited you know, to talk about Raw. Well, I'm not excited because it wasn't even that it was a bad episode. It was that it was a very... There? It was like physical. Yeah, it was a there episode. And it wasn't like, oh man, they need to be on all cylinders going into WrestleMania, which they do. It was more like they need to be on some cylinders, and they seem like they're in cruise control right now. But yeah, like even if they're they're not even traveling with like the power of a smart car at this point, it's just like kind of biking down the street. Like, hey, we're on the road to WrestleMania. I wonder if the scenery will pick up soon. Yeah, well, and there's Kevin like, Owens eating a list. That's pretty. They're, cool. they're certainly not in the fast lane. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon, David. Too soon. <laughs> Perhaps they've run into a roadblock, or it's the end of the road, or end of the line, whichever. Brandon Strive wrote so many fake names for what uh, Fastlane was, and roadblock, that like I don't, I don't remember what the real one was yeah, anymore. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, Raw was, it was just disappointing. It's just not as good to SmackDown, which we're going to spend a lot more time talking about. Uh, I, we mostly just wanted to, there's just something off about Raw, right, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it, too, is... Like, I'm excited for WrestleMania. Um, I'm not as excited for Raw's part of the card, and part of that is a combination of the presentation that they're doing and just general concerns like, is Undertaker okay? (laughs) You know? I like, I really, I'm in, like, on paper, I'm really into the idea of Roman Reigns versus Undertaker. But then. And and possibly Braun Strowman. Oh, hold on a minute. Well, outside outside of that, I'm like, well, is Undertaker, like, has he got anything left in the tank? Is this going to be fine? It's, I'm totally be happy to, like, I don't, I'm not saying I expect it to be bad or Undertaker to have something wrong with him. There's just definitely a noticeable fear I have that, like, this is going to be the one where we go, oh, no, Undertaker, you retired a year too late or something like that. And then Braun Strowman is made to look like a punk in every segment between the two. So I'm kind of like, great. So now if the match, if the match is bad, we've also managed to make Braun Strowman look like an idiot. Or relatively speaking, an idiot, like... Like a B plus student at Harvard because he's still the greatest wrestler in the history of our sport. It's like they want us to forget that. I yeah, you get the feeling. I did like um, and and, and Brent, Mr. Brandon Shroud talked about this. The face that the Undertaker made when he before he turned around, they're just like so oh, <laughs> oh man, because he like realizes he went after the wrong guy. Basically, <laughs> there are two of them. Uh, like, yeah, and I'm so old. I'm not getting out of the way of this spear. Uh, but yeah, in general, it was just outside of the Jericho Owens stuff, and 
to a certain extent, the Foley stuff, it was just kind of another episode of Raw that was the Stephanie McMahon show, also starring. Yeah, the Foley stuff was great until Stephanie came out and just, like, shit all over it. Yeah, I think kind of the overarching problem with the Foley thing is, like, this is kind of one of those TV stories that you do in the summer, where, like, you should be getting people excited for the matches that they're actually going to see at WrestleMania right now. Like, you don't want to be getting people... You know, uh, it's not the backstage drama between the authority figures that gets people pumped for WrestleMania. They want to see the, that's when they want to see the matches in the ring. And like yeah. SmackDown even made a good point, uh, you know, like along the lines of what you're saying, where they made sure to single out Shane McMahon. It's like, yeah, he's not like the other McMahons. Like, he doesn't really want to be on television right now, but then you had to go and put his head through a car window. I, I assumed it. It was because he doesn't dress in suits all the time. He loves uh, a Henley. The man yeah. loves a Henley. <laughs> He's just more of a sneaker jeans kind of guy, and they're like, you gotta watch out. Even the Shane thing, which was, t- to me, the worst part of SmackDown, was so much better than almost anything that happened on Raw in terms of building towards, I don't know, the biggest pay-per-view in the company and one of the bigger, like, what's building to be one of the bigger ones ever. Like, it, it just felt like they don't, it's not that they're not aware WrestleMania is coming. They're just hoping that if they say WrestleMania enough, a WrestleMania moment will appear out of thin air. Yeah, they're they're forgetting to do like the work to lead to those yeah. WrestleMania moments where it's like, oh, we'll just do something cool at Mania. It's like well, you could you could try entertaining us along the way. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I think nice. I think that's I think you're bang on, and I think that's really been the case going back a couple years ago to the Santa Clara Mania, where they did the Sting with Hunter, and they did like the whole schmoz with DX and the NWO. I think that that Mania was really the turning point where it seems like they kind of lost their way promotionally, and each one each year it seemed like more and more like you should be excited, you should be excited. Why aren't you excited? Here's the problem though: that Triple H Sting match is the greatest match of all time. So... <laughs> the greatest match of all time involving X-Pac, I'll give you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's pretty unequivocal. But yeah, no, I... And and I've said this over and over again, and this is something we talk about a lot on the show. Raw is just a variety show, but the problem is they have a permanent guest host now, and it's Stephanie McMahon. Hmm. So she has to be all things at all times, and it's just... It's not working anymore. And we are as pro-Steph a show as you can get on the internets. And we are both so tired of saying every week, like, what was Stephanie doing? Why is she doing this? Why is she saying one thing and then literally turning around and in the next breath saying a complete opposite thing to the person next to her? And I thought it might improve when Triple H showed back up because we'd get more of a focus of, like, it's not the authority, it's Triple H and, like, his Burly Bruisers game. But then Triple H delivered, like, a 20-minute promo where he just repeated himself over and over. And then it ended it with, like, a, there was a lot of good lines in that, but he ended it with, like, or you're a coward. And it's like, he already tried to fight you on one leg, and then you beat him with his crutch. Like, it's <laughs> coward, idiot, yes. Coward, no. Yeah, Triple H is like, yeah, I hurt Seth Rollins. And Michael Cole's like, yeah, you definitely did hurt him, and you still want to fight him. And it's like, well, okay, fine, I will murder him. <laughs> if that's what and- you're going to make me do, Michael Cole. <laughs> Even though I'm your boss and you <laughs> report to me, if you're gonna make me do it, yeah, he's a. Uh, he was, and I I love Triple H, but the promo, like you said, it was 20 minutes. It could have been 10 minutes and been a great promo. And it was 20 minutes and it was an okay promo, and it was just something that just didn't make sense at the end because his big banger line was "you're a, or you're a coward," and it's like, no, he's not a coward. Use something else, an idiot, something. I don't care. Just don't make this about Seth Rollins being a coward or not. He's clearly a crazy idiot. And those guys are almost never cowards. It really stood out how long that was, too. Like, since it happened days after South Park Regional Wrestling came out. Where they're even making fun of, like, the bullet point promo style. Where he's like, well, hold on. I need to... I'm going to scoop him up. I'm going to slam him. No, I hit all my... I hit all my points. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. uh, One day we'll talk about South Park Regional Wrestling. It, the day after WrestleMania. That's when we're recording. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to recap that. It's fine. <laughs> so, can we stop talking about Raw, or did you want to talk about anything else on Raw? <laughs> is, there any, is there anything our guests would like to say about Raw? Oh, the answer, not it's okay. especially. My main, my main point was just about Foley, and that I just thought that that was a, a summer, let's just tune in when half-watch TV angle. <laughs> yeah, definitely not WrestleMania quality, especially because he's not going to, like, in theory, he's going to be there at WrestleMania or, like, something's going to happen next week. But it also felt like maybe he's just taking time off. But wait a week, like, literally a week. 
or just have somehow be attaching a real match to it where there's someone for the last couple of at least weeks who you've been tying to Foley and saying, this one is going to be Foley's proxy in some kind of match. Like, they just haven't done that. They Like, they've done it with Sammy, but they haven't just said he's literally the proxy. Exactly. They haven't yeah, been as explicit as they could have in that regard, I don't think. I wonder if part of that is a uh, concern that Seth won't be ready to go um, 100% one-on-one. Because mm-hmm. if they're doing this, like, unsanctioned, hold harmless match, I mean, Kevin Owens <laughs> and Samoa Joe are going to be... I know, I love that language where they're like, hold on, we have to be way more like, we have stockholders now. Abeyance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Not vacant, abeyance. <laughs> but, like, Samoa Joe is probably going to be involved in that, and that's going to be, like, his WrestleMania moment. You know, his first one is not being in a match, even though they're describing him as the deadliest man in WWE. Yeah, just have him murder somebody. Like, a, well, like he's a going shot. to. He's going to like try to murder Seth Rollins, but maybe Sami Zayn will come out and, and stop that, him. And then does Seth that mean will, you know Seth Seth and Sami become like super best friends? Well, maybe not super best friends. I mean, can Ska and Heavy Metal really live that close together? <laughs> <laughs> if it's Screamo Core, I think so. Actually, I th- now I'm remembering. Uh, did you see the tweet from Keith Ellison that said that in high school or or college he was in like a Ska heavy metal band? <laughs> so maybe maybe there's a chance <laughs> there is a chance so uh we're, we're good with raw now right we're, we're done <laughs> well please. i wouldn't say that i'm gonna can we please stop talking about it thank you, you. use words i meaning and i went with the other one you're such a dick so raw was terrible but smackdown <laughs> was super duper great it was super great man smackdown's just so fun it's so fun. It's fun, and, and like you said, it's fun and serious. It understands that it's a wrestling show and not an event. It's just a wrestling show. Yeah, you used it the can... word variety show earlier to describe Raw, and SmackDown is definitely not that, even though like with some of the AJ and Shane stuff, it's been a, a little more theatrical than they typically do, but it's, it's so much more a wrestling show than Raw. Yeah, that is um, Corey Graves on uh, Bring It to the Table, or whatever the hell that stupid show's name is. I think it's called Our Propaganda Mouthpiece, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it really is. It's like this weird PTI ripoff where they even literally do the, the spot where they show them talking about a story, but like in the middle of it. So you only know like the punchline of the story or like the build up to the punchline of the story. It's very, very obvious. And they they even have the ticker on the side. Like it's crazy. <laughs> Anyways. Oh God. What was that? I just went off on a rant about that. Oh, that's my fault. My Corey, fault. Corey Graves talking about uh, how cinematic AJ Styles is. He talked about it. I think they, with AJ, understand that they can they can have those storylines because the ring product is going to deliver at such a level that it doesn't cheapen it by having stuff happen backstage. And it works really well. It keeps, you know, there's variety. They're not hitting the same notes. Uh, I think that's one of the great strengths of SmackDown is that their presentation for things can be kind of all over the place, but in a good way. And they're not stepping over each other's toes. So you can have this AJ Styles, Shane McMahon, very, like, choreographed backstage moment um, on the same show where you do the Total Bella's bullshit thing multiple times on the same show where we have Breezy Bella. like, And they do a good job of... Both, like, in storyline and in the way that they... Like you said, the presentation, but very specifically, like, the Bell, Toto Bella's bullshit stuff was done, like, pre-tape. It was, there was a lot of, like, pre-tape stuff, and that feels different and is different in terms of its presentation than the live stuff, which they can have it be close, but they, they allow these things to be compartmentalized in a good way. They're not all over their place, they're an actual show with variety as opposed to being a variety show. Like, they have something for everybody, but it's all wrestling. It's a target. It's a ri- like a very specific target, which is get guys guys and girls on this show over, sell tickets, and put butts in seat. Yeah, it kind of feels like WCW and WWF in the Attitude Era, whereas, like, WCW was never really a wrestling show. It was a show designed to beat the WWF. And the, at that time, Raw was a wrestling show, and I feel like that's what's happening with Raw. They're, they become like WCW. 
Well, they did make it a point to, they said they wanted to take, like, the best moments from the Attitude Era in terms of, like, these stories should be connected. Everyone should seem important. Everyone should seem like they're capable at any given moment. Which is how you end up with, like, Fandango wrestling John Cena. And I know it lasted for three minutes or whatever, but... I, I, the, uh, the, the whole thing about, like, everybody seemed like they had a chance and everybody was important in the Attitude Era, it's like, I think that is such a misreading because it's like, I think D'Lo Brown had fans and people got really excited for D'Lo Brown and loved him as European champion. I don't think people really ever bought D'Lo Brown as a threat to, like, the world title. I hear that argument made about the Attitude Era all the time, that, like, everybody seemed like a contender, and they did, but they seemed like a contender within their own, like, little circle of the Venn diagram. It wasn't like everybody was a main event, because that's the problem now, is they portray everybody as main event, so therefore nobody is main event. See, yeah. I, I didn't really, I didn't really read it like that back in the day. It was more like that was just the area that they were within, where it wasn't lesser necessarily. It just wasn't. Well, that I think that's what Dave is saying is that like they have framed if you're not in the main event, you're shit. And exactly. They, Sorry. And they started to build it back up with like Dean Ambrose being the Intercontinental Champion, but Chris Jericho being the United States Champion has no meaning. It has no meaning. It might have meaning when Kevin Owens beats him for it, but right now, Chris Jericho is literally champion almost by default because Roman Reigns couldn't have a title going into the Taker match. And everybody kind of knows it, I feel like. So, like, I, especially as a problem, especially in Raw, a little bit on SmackDown, but I think SmackDown does a better job of establishing that, like, it's a it's cool that the Usos are only ever going to be tag team champions does it, in a way that it doesn't feel that way on Raw. Like, they are okay with people being staying in their lane as SmackDown is. I don't feel like Raw is. I feel like Raw wants everybody to, like, shoot for the moon, but in reality, the way it's structured, it's just the rich keep on getting richer, and the mid-card and the lower mid-card end up getting no time on television because Stephanie and Mick Foley take up all of the time that they would normally get. Yeah, I mean, uh, JBL was even saying, you know, the Usos always wanted to be a tag team, a successful tag team, and they wanted to be you know, WWE Tag Team Champions and all that, so... And, like, that's fine. No one thinks lesser of the Usos for it. Uh, I don't consider them to be, like, stuck in the tag team division. Uh, and that, you know, that's a good thing. That's uh, evidence that that's, stuff's working. And SmackDown has a lot that's not working in their tag division, but, you know, uh, this week was at least a good start in yeah. terms of, you know, yeah. resuscitating that. I, was say, I think both shows have the belts on the right people to, like, actually start building a division, and that's a first step. And, like, obviously this WrestleMania season, we're not going to see that, like, big epic tag match. But I, I'm not worried about those divisions, like, long term. I don't think they're going to go away. I think the belts are on the right people kind of going into the next season, so to speak. I think, I think particularly with Cesaro and Sheamus, it looks like they have a built-in feud with Gallows and Anderson after this. Or... Enzo and Cass, I think they're going to be the ones that are, like, pushed as the big stars, like, the big babyface stars going forward, which is why I think they got the hug from Mick Foley on the mm -hmm. way out. I think, like, those guys are all going to be the guys who lead the resistance against the authority. So I feel like there are they are making even the right decisions in terms of who should be in the WrestleMania matches, not just who has the belt. Yeah, more. I mean, SmackDown's got the bigger issue with the tag division because they barely show it. And outside of the Usos and uh, American Oof. Alpha... There's not really a lot there because they don't, like, you could have Fandango and Tyler Breeze be both, you know, funny and effective, but they've decided that that's not an option, so whatever, mm. like, it's a losing battle. He was a very effective Nikki Bella, I thought. <laughs> he was Nikki Bella. <laughs> that tall drink of water, my heater. <laughs> if, I, I want Matt Hardy and Fandango to feud if Matt Hardy comes into oh, the God. WWE. <laughs> Just the, how weird and irreverent could you get and still exist in the, like, WWE universe? SmackDown would be the place to do it, but, you know, if the Hardys come back, man, they're, they're going to Raw. You think so? Yeah, I, that, oh, yeah, I guess. They got, the, they got the names. It's the A-Show. Absolutely. They have the most hype on, in terms of anything, in, in as much as anything outside of WWE can have real mainstream hype, they have the closest to that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, what SmackDown's probably going to get after Mania, or at least I hope, uh, which is what I was leading into, is like they'll probably get like the revival and DIY after Authors of Pain finished with them in NXT, and like that will, that will be how you jumpstart SmackDown's tag division. You know, they that put would work the belts, well. Yeah, they put the belts on the right team now. You 
you're not in the situation where like American Alpha won the belts a little earlier than expected because another team got injured and you know plans changed and you can really take the time to kind of rebuild the division by just immediately putting in competitive teams you can put on great matches. I mean, the Revival versus anybody will be great. Mm-hmm. So start them, start them at the bottom if you really want to and just put on good tag matches every week until people are like, holy shit, these guys are amazing. You are describing the kind of wrestling show that I would want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you mean a wrestling show, like a, a show about wrestling. It's weird. Right, uh, where it focused on like people who were talented and there because of merit. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of there because of merit, boom. Miz and Maurice, holy Jesus. That was some grade A pre-tape bullshit. It was wonderful. Well, can I say one thing about this, Nick? You mentioned kind of the, the, the Monday Night War era earlier. And just one thing from this. These reminded me of like the Jeff Jarrett going to the Grand Ole <laughs> Opry videos. Which that is totally you, right, yeah. You know me. This is something I reference all the time. But the idea that like those were vignettes that were made by heels. They were heel vignettes. Like sometimes, especially like on Raw, there's this weird blurring, right? Where you're like, well, is this all heelish or it's like did the company give this platform to the heels but like how am i supposed to feel about who but this was very clear like these were made by bad people for (laughs) bad people i thought it was just excellent i the the escalating joke was just (laughs) i bought you a ring (laughs) it's to scale (laughs) <laughs> popping the question one was just so absurdist <laughs> and to start off with that one was really just like <laughs> oh, man. tying his shoes yeah there was, it was it was great um and it said to be continued so we might get more next week yeah i i'll just come out and say it i thought that john cena's response was uh parts of it were good but i feel like miz both in terms of how i feel about it and in terms of kayfabe, kind of has the upper hand right now, which I think is interesting. I didn't think they were going to give them, like, because they are going in hard on stuff. It's one of those, like, we've allowed you, we agree that you can touch any of these things. You can't touch, like, you can't talk about my dad kind of thing. But outside of that, you can talk about whatever. And Miz is just like, cool, I am going in. It's been, it's. I thought at first, you know, like, Miz and Maurice might win when they had their initial points. And it was like, oh, this is kind of right. But now that he's just being like a huge asshole about this and Maurice has really... Maurice has performed so well in this that you're like, oh, man, I hope she stays in the women's division. And it's just a big, huge asshole to everyone in the division after this. Yeah, that'd be great. If she, like, out-assholes Alexa Bliss. <laughs> just, like, put that put that in the women's division on SmackDown. Awesome. Uh, she would be a much better version of what they had kind of been trying to do with Eva Marie. Just that super heat magnet, but who also has that kind of undeniable deal going on. I think that would oh, be yeah. great. I'll put them together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All red and blonde and everything. <laughs> so it felt like at first when they were going, you know, with their initial angles about like, oh, John Cena always does this and does, you know, he's got the magic, you know, Master of Puppets thing going on backstage. It was like, okay, well, maybe... Ms. Maurice will win, and, like, Cena will go off into the, you know, into the great unknown for a while to, you know, film his movies and shit, and then come back and get his win. But now it would feel like the Miz and Maurice have been going so hard at them the whole time, it's like, there's no way they're winning. There's no, there's no fucking way. But... I, I love Miz more than anybody on Earth. I want to see him get his come up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's absolutely <laughs> earned just getting wrecked. And, like, I hope it's competitive and, you know, we get we get some drama out of it. But I'm fine with this being, like, an extended house show match that ends with John Cena proposing to Nikki Bella in the ring. Because yeah, exactly. now, at this point, like, we talked about this a month ago, Nick, before it was like, oh, they could go in that direction. It was just like, man, wouldn't it be something if... And now it's like, oh, they're definitely doing that, and I want to see it. Now, that's a WrestleMania moment where they've done their work to lead up to it. Yes. And I... I they don't tell you a lot of stuff they sh- they show you everything that they can on smackdown and i think that's the biggest difference it makes all the difference too just all of it like uh jericho and owens they're really showing the work and that's part of the reason why that is so effective and you know you're looking forward to it for more reasons other than like oh i know that's going to be good you yeah know, even, really- on an, even on an exposition dump they gave you like here are the actual dms that this dude sent me. Yeah, it was really good. It was really well done for like a talkie seg slash Jericho, whatever the... I don't even know the name of the Jericho show. What is it? 
You don't know the name of Jericho's show? Uh, the highlight reel. Jeez. Right? Or is it the people power or something? I don't I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's someone else. The peep show. That's, that's the other one. That's one of the Bella shows. I don't know what to say about Randy and Bray, though. Like, I actually liked the Randy segment a lot after his match. I liked the Randy match. But... Randy versus Corbin was... And I love Corbin. But that was, like, way doper than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah, I they, think, yeah, I think Randy's been like I think he's actually I think he gets kind of underrated. Like I think it's true that he he does have that kind of off season rhythm where his he's uh, maybe never gets all the way out of third gear. But I thought that like his match against Styles a couple weeks was just really really kind of a top TV main event. I thought that this was really good. So I, I think the Harper one was he's kind too. of he's yeah he's I think he's peaking at the right time. Yeah, he he gets ready for the playoffs. He's LeBron James. Yeah, if we get this version of Orton in a main event against Wyatt, that will be great. The concern is we get the whatever pay-per-view it was before where, you know, everyone fell asleep halfway through it. I'm very tired. I'll do the RKO eventually, but for first, I'm going to nap. That was basically what the match was. Well, like two weeks in a row, someone, uh, like, punked out Orton on one of his signature moves as well. That's yeah. That could come up later. Good breadcrumb. I, th- I think Randy Orton maybe would be like maybe he could kick up the investment if he could find like maybe some sort of writer or maybe he could ask Bray or someone like I think he would be doing better here if he knew at which point he was a mole like like I see it on his face like he's like what's my motivation here like when exactly was the moment when I decided to bring Bray Wyatt down like I think the fact that that's been like so unclear like what are the actual motivations here the fact that that's never been clarified, I think, is just kind of the one thing that's that's dragging all this down. Like you said, Mark, I have a ton of faith in the match. But it's like I feel like they've just like they want us to forget chapters one through 18 of like the 20 chapter story. And I'm just like, I, I want things to make sense. Darn it. <laughs> I'm not willing to give up. I thought they did a decent job of tying it back where Orton was just like, I realized I was never going to beat them until I split them up completely and gained his trust. So after Harper was officially out. And Orton had, you know, convinced Bray that he had nothing to worry about. He was like, oh, also, can I, like, have the keys to the cabin for the weekend? Is that cool? <laughs> yeah. I just don't know, like, what what were his motivations from day one? I just think that that needed to be more clear. But I, I maybe I... I like, can't. why would why did he want to end Bray Wyatt to begin with? Yeah, Exactly. I, like, before Wyatt had the title, why did he join the Wyatt family just to break up the Wyatt family? Well, they were feuding. But why, I guess my my question, I, I agree with Dave on, uh, about this on some level, uh, especially the way he's framing it. I th- and I think that's the problem for a lot of people is we never understood, like, yeah, Randy Orton's a dick, but even th- this is a lot even for him to, like, infiltrate a group that, like, do a bunch of shit and then murder somebody, basically, is, like, even a lot for him, and he's kicked people's dads in the head. Yeah, He's and it's like so the guy who the guy who joins the cult to infiltrate it and destroy it. That guy is like an honorable baby face who's been a good guy all along. So like, is that is that what it is now that he's just like a great guy or is it just that they're both moral relativists and they Randy Orton decided like, hey, you know, I'll be the bigger, meaner moral relativist if I burn this guy's shack down <laughs> and the remains of Sister Abigail. You, you can't forget that. Yeah, whatever or whoever, like whatever all that actually represents, right? All those vague ideas that were constantly referenced but never fleshed out. Well, I think there's one thing we can agree on, and it's that Randy Orton realizes he's made a huge mistake. <laughs> oh, you mean when he showed up in a room filled with lamb or goats? Like, Yeah, and it was, was like, oh shit, I'm being held down, and oh shit, he now has the power of this, this crazy demon woman. And, oh, <laughs> shit, he took a bath in her ashes. I wouldn't do that. I used to shit in gym bags. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his interview with Renee was awesome. Before the lights went out and him just being like, yeah, I've done some messed up shit. But those guys are weird. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, unless you guys want to go in depth on Baron and Dean Ambrose instead of just saying, oh, that'll be a good match. Dean Ambrose has a tendency to live just below expectations. <laughs> not against big guys, and not when weapons are involved. And this might have both of those things. Uh, Brock Lesnar and weapons at the Brock Lesnar match. Yeah, but at that point, you're dealing with someone who wants to do nothing that you say. Oh, because that's true. while he was eating his Jimmy John sandwich, he's like, I don't fucking care, I'm not doing it. You can talk to me all you want, I'm going to do whatever I feel like. I had imagined he was literally eating a sandwich when Dean yeah. came up to him. What? 
what I'm eating. <laughs> well, we have a big match at WrestleMania. Uh, made of sandwich out of Jimmy John's. So, you know, he had to replace any, you know, like lost hair or skin or anything that came off. You know, it's, wait, it's you're thing. presupposing he's constructed entirely of Jimmy John sandwiches. Oh, I'm not like guessing about this. You don't, you don't know that. <laughs> Jesus. I assumed it was a metaphor. Like you are what you know. No, you need to be better prepared. If you're going to host a podcast like this, that's fair. You're None right. Of the you know what? Vegetables in them, just so we're clear. Oh well, why would you put vegetables in a sandwich? Well, do you hate Lesnar. America? Yeah. Do you, if you hate America, that sounds like a good idea. There's for only a one vegetable that Brock Lesnar eats, and it's corn. But he doesn't eat it like a regular person. He just he shoves the whole husk in, and then he just pulls it, it out. Like, no, no, he doesn't like, pull it out. He doesn't pull it out. He just he eats it. Just, <laughs> I was imagining like in the uh, like cartoons when they the eat fish. the chicken, yeah, or the fish, and it's just like, oh, that's what we got left. But no, he just he just chews on it like that, like he just slow takes bites of it and just continues to push it like further in until it's all gone. Uh, what a hero! So Baron Corbin, yay! Uh, Dean Ambrose, maybe less yay. Um, Baron Corbin came through NXT. <laughs> Ooh, I hear you're doing a transition. Ah, uh, yeah, that's what's up. Dean I can Ambrose feel you pivoting. Did, yeah, did not, though, which uh, is a whole different thing. Anyways. <laughs> Wait, Ambrose went through NXT? Uh, yeah. He went for the FCW, didn't he? Yeah, which was, like, he was there at that weird part where they were mashed together. Oh, oh okay, I didn't when, realize. Like, literally nobody was paying attention to it. Roman Reigns is the only one of the S.H.I.E.L.D. who, like, oh. wasn't anywhere. Good to know. I did not know that. Learn something new every day. Yeah. Like I said, be more prepared, podcast host. Jeez. I am prepared. I got Dave to come on the show to talk about <laughs> NXT TakeOver. Boom. Booker. <laughs> so, Dave, tell us yep. all about what's going to happen at NXT TakeOver in order of importance. No, I'm kidding. Just what match are you most excited about? Well, imagine what I'm most excited about. Well, to tie back to something that Mark said earlier, I'm most excited about the triple threat tag team title match that's DIY, Revival, and the Authors of Pain. Mark was talking earlier. Those were the three names that he mentioned that could save kind of the SmackDown tag team scene and make that show way better. And I think that they're going to bring the best Bell to Bell match, the thing that I'm most excited to see in uh, Orlando. Yeah, I, I'm inclined heavily to agree with you. It's an elimination match too, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Oh, man, I love an elimination match. And, like, in tag teams, it's even funnier because, you know, yeah. someone disappoints their partner so bad, and then they both just sadly walk to the back. <laughs> <laughs> Usually with a hand on the back of their neck, like one hand on the back of the neck, looking down at the floor, sad <laughs> shuffle steps. We assume that the Authors of Pain are going to win this, and both DIY and The Revival are going to head on up to WWE? Or it feels like. I mean, the... With the way things have gone so far, Raw keeps getting, like, the shiny singles toys. So at some point, it feels like SmackDown just goes, okay, we're just going to take this whole tag team. And Raw goes, what's a tag team? <laughs> and then it's, you know, that's fine. Yeah, I, I think that scenario is pretty much bang on, Nick. I think Authors of Pain are, like, the perfect tag team champions for NXT. Just big, scary guys who beat people up. You can run just about any, you know, quote-unquote exciting young superstars up against that. And then I see Revival definitely on SmackDown because I... I think they're too similar, or too Gallows and Anderson also. I, I think that's another thing that's keeping Revival off Raw. I think those are two acts that we better served on on different shows. Yeah, because they're not rip-offs of each other, but they're too similar for somebody who hasn't seen either of them to understand why they're different. No, if you only have a couple teams in each division, you don't need two sets of grinders in either division. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they're a different kind of grinders, because I feel like uh, the Revival more and more has established themselves as a, like, tweener tag team, where Gallows and Anderson are just bad guys. They're just heels. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no, like, are they good, but, like, do bad things? No, no, they're assholes. I but, feel like the Revival more and more, even when they were cheaters, would cheat in a way that was, like, stretching the rules, not breaking them. Yeah, I mean, they were cheating in kind of a realistic, classic pro wrestling kind of 1980s sense. Which, but, but, but you just hit on kind of the thing that I like the least about the revival now, which is that because of the, because we are all terrible nerds who can appreciate what great heels look like, now suddenly the revival are in these tweener roles. And it's so not their fault. It's like I, I blame every one of us who's, who's an adult who watches wrestling for them <laughs> even doing remotely baby face things. It's funny now, they've moved into an attitude era kind of thing where literally everybody cheated. And like, 
the rest just never saw anything. So, listen, it's, it's dental, kind of work with dental that, and vision that. are not covered under the WWE plan, nor are the wrestlers. So, <laughs> but it, <laughs> DIY, I feel like they could go to Raw if only because both of those are such good cruiserweight performers. They uh, might. I'm sorry. Don't Did do I that. Something? Did I say something offensive? Oh, well, it's not. The it, 205 Live and the Cruiserweight Division have been, like, they're not on life support anymore, but I'm still not ready for, like, they'll do more good as a tag team for now. I think so. I don't think that matters at all to the WWE. I don't think the WWE gives a shit what I think. <laughs> I think Champa would be a really good opportunity as a singles act on the main roster to kind of make good on a lot of the opportunities they missed with Cesaro. Like he doesn't, you know, he doesn't do the swing and he doesn't have the kind of goofy charisma that Cesaro has. But I think that Champa could be one of those guys where they could really take someone who was kind of a popular indie act, but who also had a lot to offer in there and and really push them well. Like I think he could be like an IC US level singles guy at some point. Yeah, where Gargano's more of like a, oh, he's good, I like that guy. He's very good, uh, and it's it's just as long as Vince McMahon is around and there's certain certain expectations of the way people, like, look and stuff like that. Like, I, ju- I just don't see him with his look. I mean, as much as there's, you know, Drew Gulak out there, uh, I still I still just don't really see Gargano as a, as a player on a roster with Vince McMahon booking. Do you believe in Gargano? Do you believe in Johnny Wrestling, Mark? Uh, I mean, you guys haven't said anything that I don't believe. I really like him, but I don't... You know, I like Ciampa better. Um, I think they have people coming up from NXT still, like Oni Lorcan, who could do similar things, get similar crowd reactions with the kind of just natural, unspoken charisma that you sometimes connect with the crowd. Um, and they might be more willing to do something with that, just because they've already got this tag team magic in... You know, as you said, there's that cruiserweight association, so maybe those are the two places that, you know, he spends most of his, his WWE career in. And it's not a bad place to be in. So, and, and this is something, I, yeah, I, I think is interesting what, about what you said, David, which is that the Authors of Pain are like the perfect NXT tag team. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure if their kind of dominance can really happen in the WWE anymore for a tag team. I think it could during a downtime. Like if you have a time where the titles have not been focused on for a couple of months, where they've kind of fallen to the side, like like the tag team titles often do in the WWE every few years, I think they're the great team to cut, or sorry, a great team to to do kind of a soft reset on. I agree they can't just go up there and squash everybody, you know, but but I think at the right moment that team could really mean something on the main roster. I mean, I recently, plug, 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 uh, I recently wrote about them as kind of being one of the real MVP acts of NXT over at WrestleDelphia, uh, just because I think that sort of their combination of that power style and, you know, Paul Ellering in there as just a, a great manager who has that connection to the real classic money program, but is also, you know, uh, kept up to beat with, with the wrestling scene now and stuff. I mean, I really think that they're, they have much higher ceiling than, let's say, uh, uh, the Ascension. Thank you, thank you. My memory. I mean, they are <laughs> on the Ascension, um, essentially, because there was no there was no one for the Ascension to feud against when they were the big dominant team. But you know, at least Office of Pain seemed like they they started competition in place, even if you take some of those teams away after Mania. And also, they're just I, I like the ascension but these guys seem like they're actually really good yes yeah each of them individual like like you said they squat they don't even squash people they they just beat them real bad and i don't know how well that works because you the way tag teams seem to work in the wwe is if you're a face you like get the hot tag yada 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 the, the entire team's kind of built around whoever has the hot tag where with the heels you have to be chicken shit heels that like can't get a good win going like over and over again you look at any of the heel tag teams they're all cheaters even new day when they were heels they were cheaters even if they were were faces were cheaters yeah Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) sorry no don't be don't be sorry i get on nick about this all the time and he's like no nope no (laughs) i didn't see it the ref didn't see it they're angels. They're beautiful angels. Yeah, no, the Authors of Pain seem like they... It's less that the Author of Pain characters wouldn't work on WWE television than that they don't have characters like the Authors of Pain on WWE television. But I will say this. 
Braun Strowman, I think, in the same way that Daniel Bryan is, what, or like pushed a, a lot for smaller guys in terms of like making way on for them on the card. I think Braun Strowman is one of the first giant guys that they treat like a normal. They allow to wrestle like a normal sized guy who happens to be enormous. Uh, if that makes sense, like they don't make them do stupid. They don't make him do stupid giant stuff. They make him do stuff because he's a big guy. He's more jig, big John Stud than like mm-hmm. Frank Gonzalez. Oh yeah, well definitely. <laughs> if he wasn't, that would be a major problem. Now you have me all excited for this like fantasy stable that's the Authors in Pain and Braun Strowman managed <laughs> by Precious Paul Ellering. Yeah, that would be. Oh, that'd be, they would never lose, and that that would be actually the type of thing that you'd bring them up for. It's like them just being in a dis- like the destroyers. That would actually be the perfect way to bring them up. I feel like is you bring up hit them and Paul Ell- Ellering into like the uh, authority, and you have them be the tag team that holds the belts and murders people. Could they say Legion of Doom without DC like suing them into next week? <laughs> They'll just say it once and make sure nobody heard, and then like say it again. Just look around. Um, <laughs> so we all have. I-, I think we all have authors of pain winning this, right? Yeah, it seems like it's time for everyone else to be to be done. Uh, you could say overdue in some cases. Both total teams. agreement. So yeah, so this match looks good, and then it's kind of a short card in terms of an official card, but there seems to be like a lot of stuff moving around. You you were talking uh, about this uh, with me offline, Dave. You think that they're going to be doing something with uh, Cassius Ono, probably. Yeah, I think he'll get on the card. I mean, he's he's not in one of the big three title matches, and that's all that's advertised uh, as we tape. But yeah, I think Ono will get on the card. I think CN would be a great opponent for him. That's a heel they've really brought along, and he's someone who's really improved and, and deserving of kind of making it on another card. Because, I mean, he, he his babyface Sparkly Suspenders debut was a, a mess. But I, I really think he's kind of repurposed himself into a really effective heel who could be kind of a Miz type one day, perhaps. Um, so I would love to see Ono and Cien. I think that would be a cool matchup. Um, how do we feel? Uh, can we just talk for a second? Can I just talk for a second? Can I just come out and say, why the... Can I curse on this podcast, Mark? What the fuck, dude? Of course you can. <laughs> That's what I said when I saw Cash's Ono's outfit. I said, what the fuck? What <laughs> the fuck? I, I, listen, I'm not asking for people to be like, supermodels male or female but that was gross <laughs> i'll say this i i uh, i am married and my wife erica i respect her opinion very much on wrestling because she's a normal person who's not a nerd but she sits next to me and absorbs a lot of this um and she turned to me when she saw that match and she asked how am i supposed to take this guy seriously as a professional athlete if that's how seriously he takes himself so yeah, that's like- officially my my thoughts on ono's look yeah, I'm not, again, I'm not asking for an Adonis, but, like, dude needs to not wear short pants with a tank top. Tucked like, in. Tucked in. Tucked in, what? fake Knicks jersey gimmick. Yeah, not good. There was, a, there was a rumor, and who knows how true it is, that essentially this they dressed him up like that as, like, a, like a oh, hazing. Right. Uh, you know? That's so, awful. Well, <laughs> Yeah. But, no, I know. I mean, it's it's one thing to rib someone about that, and I, it's it's a it, if there's something to criticize him for, that's certainly the 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 fair criticism. I would say, you know, he's he's very good in most other respects as a wrestler, but I mean, to to rib someone like that at it on TV would be pretty lame. Yeah, and I, again, I don't think it's like everyone has to be this like chiseled out of stone thing. It was just like, dude, really? And if it's a rib, I understand, but like, never again, please. Not a funny rib. It was disturbing to watch a grown man, any grown man, let's just say that, any grown man in a white tank top that is tucked in to white underpants, <laughs> that's not any god I'm familiar with, okay? <laughs> Dude, longer shorts, untuck. Solved. <laughs> exactly. He'd be fine dressed up. Kevin Owens wears a t-shirt, shorts, and like Spanx. Yes. Like, I'm good. Just do that. Like, yeah, and then Sanity's doing something, right? I would assume they must be. They um on tonight's edition, uh they are they're in a six man against Ty Dillinger, No Way Jose, and Roddy Strong. So I was thinking maybe EY gets married to Dillinger and No Way or or maybe Dillinger tags with Roddy Strong against uh Killian and Alexander Wolf. And you know what I think somehow something in that six man tonight is gonna turn is gonna turn into guys getting split off for the takeover show. 
which sounds good. Those are all really good workers. I'm not the hugest, the hugest. I'm not the biggest Roderick Strong fan. Uh, and by not the biggest, I mean I don't like him. Here's and I don't like watching him wrestle. Here's what? a question. Is anyone the biggest Roderick uh, Strong fan? I think that in that era, like maybe like a 2006 or 2005 to 2008, where you went an indie show to see guys chop each other real hard, I think there was like a context where a lot of people were huge fans of him. But now I, I tend to agree with you guys. Yeah, it's not the Dave and I. Him. It's just I, if they push him toward being like NXT champion someday while he's there, I will probably be asleep. No, I could no agreed agreed. Yeah, uh, Dave and I went to a show. It was main evented by uh, Nigel McGuinness and Claudio Castagnoli. And we watched, I think it was like an FIW World Heavyweight Championship match with Roderick Strong. And literally half the match is him and the two other dudes just chopping each other in like... They literally stood in a triangle. Like they stood in a triangle for with their feet planted for a solid two minutes just trading these triangle chops and it was it was one of those things where it, it just hit it, it just went right over that line. <laughs> <laughs> You're like ah, uh, not as bad as Necro Butcher getting smacked in the face from Point Blank Rage at range by Morishima with a steel chair. Instant concussion. I've never seen someone get a concussion concussion instantly. Instant concussion. So <laughs> I've seen I saw Biff Busick and Eddie Edwards chop for pretty much that long once, just back and forth, real hard chops, and both of their chests just look mangled. But it was also as part of like a sixty minute Iron Man match. So, yeah, that's, that's the gimmick. Yeah, yeah. When you're yeah, talking this was a seven minute title, are, match. <laughs> when you're talking like, okay, that's this is the two minutes at the end where they they don't have enough energy to do anything but stand in place <laughs> and just hit each other as hard as humanly possible. How, uh, how long do you think Ty Dillinger has in NXT? Do you think he's like a uh, Crash Davis kind of character or? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, Crash Davis. That's that's kind of a sad comparison. I don't know. It's it's really hard to say. He's someone who maybe before the Royal Rumble I would have told you was an NXT lifer, and then he got that reaction at the Rumble coming out at ten. And like, I mean, you know, there's no reason, and and I wish there was more for him, but there's no reason that guy couldn't be Santino. You know what I mean? They love the comedy guys who are just there to take bumps and do jobs and stuff. And he's a guy who could who could maybe wind up doing that on the main event, just being kind of the lovable fan favorite jobber, kind of the new Zack Ryder or something along those lines. But I don't know. I think that whether he's, regardless of which roster it's on, I think that there's a ceiling that he's hit. I think, you know, that he could translate to the main roster and be just as valuable as he is in NXT now, but I don't think he would ever be more on the main roster than where he's gotten in NXT. I mean, yeah, he, that's the feeling I got too. He would be perfect on SmackDown's mid card because you know, going back to weaknesses of SmackDown, they don't really have a mid card. Um, mm-hmm. There's Mark, kind of that weird Mark. Yes, I have something I want to say. Oh, get out of here, Dolph Ziggler! You're not a, you're not invited <laughs> on this podcast. I want to sing a poem about my feelings. No, no, go attack a polo <laughs> cruise again or something. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I I think the mid card for SmackDown is a great place to be, and Santino in my eyes at least, is a future Hall of Famer, so that's not a bad, like... Santino was the last, the second-to-last guy in an Elimination Chamber match at one point, right? <laughs> yeah, he was. And a Royal Rumble. He is a Rumble, great... too? Yeah, he's the... In the Alberto Del Rio one, he is the last guy eliminated, oh, because I mean, Alberto Del Rio I eliminates somebody. Next list for that Royal Rumble, too, I guess, so... And yeah. you guys were after. Since they had 40 people. <laughs> So, uh, and one last question about this general mid-card. I guess you'd call it the NXT mid-card. What is happening with uh, No Way Jose? Is he losing steam? Have I, cause I, Where I is think, his trajectory, I guess? Well, I think what happened with No Way Jose is I think that he started with this very big novelty gimmick. Like, I remember the first match he did, he literally, like, wound up his arm and did, like, the big pitching gesture and stuff. And it's like, that stuff has slowly been kind of coming down. And at first, it might seem like him cooling off, but I think that it's sort of him gearing up from a transition, or for a transition, away from being novelty first uh, kind of wrestling second and being a more serious wrestling character. So it may appear that he's cooled down because like some of the most over the top exciting things are gone, but I think it's a sign of good, more serious things to come. It's he's the, great. It's kind of transition that like Adam Rose never made. Yeah, instance. right. <laughs> Where, like you couldn't say he had nothing past the character and the gimmick, and once the novelty of it wore off, you're kind of like oh, okay. And 
And now what? And then it seemed like he was becoming some weird, like, drug-addled, abusive guy. But, you know, for some reason, that didn't work. <laughs> Can't imagine why that wouldn't get over. Well, yeah, I'd love that didn't work because they say. couldn't... Yeah, they couldn't go in as much as they needed to for the Adam Rose gimmick, so it was the surface, like, he's kind of mean, and it was like, no, he should have been, like, a violent, angry person. But yeah, they were like... But then, I but then you know, it, domestic abuse kind of made that, so well, it's probably yeah, a good idea yeah. to do that. Well, yeah, of course. I'm saying right after. <laughs> No, I get right. it. I get it. It's, it's more I'm saying it's a good thing they didn't go in that direction. Oh, yeah. Because they would have been like, right. wow, it really turned his real life character up to 11, huh? Yeah, or like, in a sad state of affairs, WWE has once again turned light, art into life. Because yeah. uh, I, I really liked him. I've seen him live. He's super He's super charismatic, in a, physically charismatic in a way that a lot of guys aren't. He has the physical charisma part of it. Yeah, 100% agreed. I mean, he's fantastically exciting looking, like just his look with like the big hair. And when he first comes to the ring, he's got like the unbuttoned shirt and it's kind of like flapping around everywhere. It's like he is a spectacle making his entrance. And he's one of those wrestlers where he he does the little things where he he is wrestling a solid, fundamentally sound wrestling match. But he just puts kind of the little flares into things and he like picks the moments to to start, you know, getting the dancing in there. He's not just like Disco Inferno who does a move and dances and does a move and dances and does a move and dances until the guy comes back against him, you know? It's like he's he's really, really entertaining. Like you said, he's got that body charisma of just the way he acts. It's like you can't help but get into it. So I, I think he's got a really bright future. And, I mean, getting back, connecting back to kind of calling back to an earlier discussion, like he's in their lane of what they do on Raw. Like that is – I cannot – Imagine someone saying that Noah Jose would not be a fit for WWE Raw. Oh, he'd be perfect for it. And he's he's just a big guy outside of the physical charisma that you can believe him succeeding and not just being like, oh, this guy's fun-loving or whatever. Like, yeah. he's going to beat your ass if you interrupt his dancing or something. And not in, like, an evil Fandango way, just like, <laughs> it's like, dude, come on, I was really feeling myself right there. What are you doing? <laughs> No, that's I know that that was what was great about the thing where he and uh, Ari, when Aries turned on him, where he's like, "Oh man, like I just I just decided that you were a nice enough guy to party with me, and then you just proved me wrong. Now I must destroy you." <laughs> <laughs> I, I have another question. Um, uh, Hideo Itami. Yes. Is he doing anything? Uh, ooh, your testing line. I not that I can think of. <laughs> well, no, because like, I, I mean, he's not shows, but that's uh... yeah. No, in in general, I'm just interested. Like, what are they? Before we talk about the two title matches, I, I wanted to talk about, like, who do we see coming up from NXT after WrestleMania? Well, uh, earlier we discussed DIY and The Revival as candidates to go up. Absolutely. I think they would be a big help. Um, I mean, one name we haven't mentioned somehow is we haven't talked about Nakamura, who's, who's in the main event of this TakeOver Orlando show. Um, I think he's someone who's ready to step in in a similar way as Samoa Joe and just be, you know, right there on top at either show. Uh, ready to to uh, make a huge impact. That's kind of the interesting question with him, isn't it? The either show, because you could see him succeeding on Raw as just this giant personality, but at the same time, if SmackDown's more the wrestling show, you kind of assume there's going to be a bigger reaction for him sooner, and that they'll handle him better uh, than Raw would. This is my this is me carefully tap dancing around the fact that like Raw has. I mean, uh, WWE's never really produced a main event Japanese character. Yokozuna. Oh, what, what did I just say? <laughs> He's not really, you know. <laughs> I don't. You're, you're really going to hurt his feelings here, Mark. I, I don't oh, know. What, what do you mean? Yokozuna's Yokozuna means well, he's the grand champion. I mean, Mark, don't, don't do this to me, man. Okay, it's fine. I mean, <laughs> he's Japanese. America is the great Satan. I don't remember the gimmick. I just remember <laughs> that Japan was super over. That's all I remember. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll leave. We'll leave it alone. So yeah, no, I, I think there was real concern with NX uh, with them being able to. I mean, any per, I'm just gonna come out and say to any dude who's not white, it is very difficult to get the kind of push you deserve. It, we've seen it over and over again. They've had. The Rock, basically, and Booker T is the only two people of color, basically, to ever win a championship. <laughs> like, it's crazy. So I have concerns about Nakamura because he is so big. He is such an, in, like, he is an instant main eventer. I have real fears that they're not going to be able to handle it, and they're going to screw it up somehow. 
Well, if Styles goes to Raw after Mania, like rumors suggest, and also like his story suggests, because like why the hell would he stick around SmackDown after all this? Maybe Nakamura moving immediately into SmackDown, SmackDown's main event would be a good way to deal with all this, because you can kind of ride the momentum of him coming up mm-hmm. uh, straight into angles. And don't you kind of want to see like Nakamura versus Bray Wyatt? I want to see Nakamura against literally every single person in the roster, including Eva Marie. <laughs> and Eva Marie think- wins. He could pull it off. He could make it work. Oh, yeah, I believe it. <laughs> he, he goes for the Kinshasa. She ducks under the knee. Boom, schoolboy. <laughs> <laughs> I think AJ Styles, you mentioned his name and sort of saying if he went to Raw, maybe Shinsuke on SmackDown. I think the two of them should be on the same show. I think that one of the things that they've done really well through JBL and Mara Ranallo is put over the idea of AJ as the big Japanese star. And even though it's a repeat, you're promoting a match that another company promoted two or three years ago. I think this would be kind of a time to make that exception because of the way they've put styles over as the big Japanese star on SmackDown. I think it would be perfect, kind of a perfect match to bring them in. And that could be, that could be something big for say SummerSlam. I mean, given their track record with, the women's division on Raw, I don't think rehashing feuds from a different company <laughs> are much of an issue for them. Especially if you have the same writers on both. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anybody else that comes to mind? I mean, Elias Sampson's coming up. We know that. Um, how <laughs> is there anybody else that I'm not thinking of that, like... Well, I'll give you a sleeper because we've said we've said the we've been talking about the women's division a little. I like Nikki Cross a lot, and I she is so different. I compare her to like Sabu, where the bell would ring and Sabu would just like splay like splay out and dive at the guy's leg and not come anywhere close to getting it. You know, like she's got that crazy kind of Sabu intensity that's so different from anything oh. that any of the women uh, on Raw or oh. SmackDown are doing. So I'd say Nikki Cross is kind of my sleeper pick as someone who could come up in the near future and have a really really big impact on tv on. Uh, live news happening here on cage i'd seats weekly wrestling podcast uh we lost mark but dave and i are going to finish up because you know you finished the match i don't know what else to say um so we have two matches left uh ember moon versus asuka for the women's title is the is the second main event i guess or are they booking it more like are they booking it as though those are two main events? Or are they really putting the rude Nakamura, in your opinion, in terms of like how you feel about it? Is is Nakamura and Rude as big as you feel like it should be? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I don't really think that Rude and Nakamura is on that level that some of those previous title matches have been, including even like their first match. I don't know. Nakamura has been almost a little too absent from TV, selling this this injury from their previous match. I actually think... I don't know. It it feels like Nakamura's kind of hit that point where he's one of the first people who's kind of lost some heat by being in NXT. Like his popularity seems like it's rolling back a little. And uh, Robert Roode is one of my favorite wrestlers of the kind of TNA era. Like I think he was one of the best talents that they ever had. But at the same time, and uh, this is terrible to say, I, I feel like Nakamura has slipped back. He's kind of fallen down to Rude's level, rather, or at least promotionally, it seems like they've kind of booked oh, him mean. down towards Rude. And I like Robert Rude very much. I, I, I hate to, I hate to say these things. Yeah. No, and I, I, Robert Robert Rude's NXT champion. He's not WWE, at least to me. And I think that's like Nakamura has WWE World Champion multiple time ceiling where i think robert rude if he came into the company 10 years ago absolutely but now is kind of always going to be like a united states title is i think he could totally become a multiple time united states or intercontinental champion but i just don't see him going past that where with nakamura he's a big flagship character yeah that have on the show rude's future in wwe is as a useful wrestler nakamura's future is as a featured top star wrestler yeah, and that those are two valid ways to get a make a living. So <laughs> oh, absolutely, no judgment here. Yeah. I'm just saying that I think that I don't know. I like Rude very much. He's excellent. His matches are as good as anybody in NXT is capable of right now. But it, somehow, I think that this title's kind of taken a hit during his reign, and I think that this is the first takeover that I can really remember where the title didn't feel really strong and really like. You know, one of the, just that that catalyst that was bringing everything together. Is that the case for the women's match? 
No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I think Asuka has been like, if you took everybody in WWE, you know, all the different colored brands, um, I think that Asuka is like maybe the strongest character of the last year. I said in something I wrote a couple of weeks back for WrestleDelphia, I also identified her as being kind of one of NXT's MVPs because she's also almost this like Bret Hart now where she just puts on great matches against everybody and her promos. It's like, uh, you know, she, she doesn't say a lot, but what she did, she does, she's very clear. She gets herself across. She's someone who is easy to like. I just think that she's maybe the strongest character currently collecting a paycheck from the WWE. So I have no problem getting excited with her title matches against anybody. Well, I guess my question with that would be, do we really think Ember Moon has a chance on God's Green Earth? Uh, no, but I think she's the right person to have here because I think against Billy Kay and Peyton Royce, like that feud didn't do a lot for Asuka. It just kind of seemed like a lesser version of the great work that she had done earlier with uh, Emma and Dana Brooke. So I did think that she needed a fresh opponent here. And Ember Moon is someone who, from her debut, has been kept really strong. And she has a great finish, that that flying stunner. You know, she was instantly over at that NXT show back in Brooklyn. That was kind of her pay-per-view debut. So, I mean, I, I think that she's as good an opponent as they possibly have for Asuka. And I think that if Asuka were to graduate, I think Ember Moon would be the clear choice to be that next champion. Oh, yeah, I'm just more worried that, though I guess, and, and this is something Mark and I have talked about a bunch, NXT's WrestleMania is Brooklyn. So this is like their Royal Rumble, almost, in terms of importance of the non-title, like the non, there's no Royal Rumble equivalent match, but it's that level of like, it's important because it's a takeover, but it's not important beyond being a takeover. Yeah, so, I think that's a good explanation. It, it's a monthly pay-per-view that is also going down WrestleMania weekend to keep people from going to too many of the other indie shows that are going to be in the area. So, yeah, and, like, for me, it helps to frame that. So this match isn't a WrestleMania blow-off match. It's Survivor Series, do you think you can beat the champion kind of fair. Match. That's fair. That's fair. If you look at it, that, If you look at it that way, it's not as disappointing a main event as if you say this is the WrestleMania weekend main event. Yeah, the 92... Uh, 92 survive that survivor series between Michaels and Hart. That's the title match at the like 92 uh, survivor series. And the 93 it's razor Ramon versus Bret Hart. Like those type of, that's what this feels like is you have these up and coming people. And then you have the Bret Hart type who's there to like make them into a main eventer because they are the type of guy that worked their way up to the main event. And that's the only way you can have a guy to teach somebody how to be a main eventer. Like Hulk Hogan can teach anybody how to do anything. No, Rude is, I mean, Rude is an excellent, like in that kind of player coach role. I, I can't really think of a more ideal wrestler than Rude to be, to be that guy. Yeah. And so Asuka has this in the bag, right? There's no chance. Uh, yeah, I would say there's absolutely no chance unless like, no, there's absolutely no chance. <laughs> I'll, cut, I'll bite everything off there. I would, I would put all my money on Asuka. Unless like the day before there's, she's getting suspended for 30 days. Like that's literally the only chance. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, exactly. If she gets caught driving with Rob Van Dam and Sabu and there's some, <laughs> some weed and some pills and stuff like, you know what I mean? Like, but, but the, otherwise she's, she's going to go over strong, you know, kick to the head, Oscar Locke. Yeah. Um, and then the final match of the night is Robert Roode. We, and we, we talked about it a little bit, so you all know how I feel about this match and, and Nakamura. I, I love Nakamura. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but like you said, I just don't care about him as much as I did when he first came in. Like when he first came in, I was so excited. Like it was electric when he came in and now it's kind of like, well, when, when, Right before he joined, coming off his big matches at Wrestle Kingdom 9 and Wrestle Kingdom 10, he was the closest thing since maybe Chris Benoit, like 15 years ago. He was maybe the closest thing to a consensus best wrestler in the world that like people from all different uh, genres of wrestling fandom could kind of agree, like Shinsuke Nakamura, the best, if not one, one of the best, if not the best. But I feel like in NXT, it's like that's just been brought down to earth, like Shinsuke Nakamura, any one of the three preceding years before he came to NXT, you could say that he was the best wrestler in the world. This last year, I don't think that you could say that he was a top five performer. And that's just because of the way that he's been booked and because of 
you know, the way the matches are put together. It's no fault of his, but this portrayal of Shinsuke Nakamura is not the Shinsuke Nakamura that they bought. They have, without any doubt, devalued that asset during his time in NXT, regardless of how much I might have enjoyed his feud with Samoa Joe or, you know, how cool it is just to see him in an American ring. They have, without doubt, diminished Nakamura in his time there. Yeah, because I, and I think a lot of it was not seeing the day to day kind of thing that happens when you like see a Japanese baseball player, where it's like you don't see what they're like day to day, so you have a tendency to like if they're great as great as they they should be against I don't want to say lesser competition, but less well known competition, um, in a different style with more freedom, like an easier place to be great in. I think we then see them every day and we notice like, well, every promo isn't the greatest promo you ever heard. and Every match isn't the greatest match you've ever seen. So we have a tendency to go, and I think it's somewhat valid, and it's also just human nature to go, oh God, the guy's not as good as we thought. And I, I think that's what's happening with him is that it, it's a literal, in a literal sense, like overexposure, but at the same time, it's something that's unavoidable given the American style. Yeah, okay. I think that I think that that's that's a complex point, but I don't necessarily disagree with it. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's hard to not get overexposed now on television. Like it's not like the it feels as though American wrestling fans, even if you were watching New Japan World, were were getting the Hulk Hogan in the eighties amount of Shinsuke Nakamura, not the John Cena in the 2010s. Well, I'll reference, I'll reference another wrestling journalist here, if you don't mind. Um, Bruce Mitchell has said throughout the last year that, like, a really great point, that back in the 80s, guys used to accept less pay to be on TV because the idea is if you were on TV, it was going to get you over more and you could make pay other places. The, the way to get over was to get on TV, especially on the good markets like Crockett or Georgia or the WWF or whatever. Anyway, but now the best way to be over is not to be on TV because look at Bill Goldberg. He walked in there having not been on TV in whatever a dozen years and he's instantly the most over guy in the company. He's on TV for two months. People are booing him and saying, fire Goldberg. Like The best way to be over in the WWE is to be returning, is to not be on TV for long stretches of time. And that's just like a huge overarching problem with the way they do things. And Nakamura is like certainly, you know, one of many victims. Yeah, they have no concept of like switching out the storylines every week. Less so on SmackDown than on Raw. Raw, it's the same seven storylines until they all burn out, and they all seem to burn out at the same times. It's not, there's very rarely like a, this storyline went for three weeks, this storyline went for seven weeks, this storyline went for 20 weeks. It's all, these storylines all went from WrestleMania to SummerSlam, mm -hmm. from WrestleMania to blank. Like, Great. like you. You're absolutely correct, and once again, I said this at the top of the show, I trace that back to really that kind of Santa Clara mania. I really think that that's one of those, that was the year where just things fell into that pattern of, yeah, everything's booked from mania to SummerSlam, and, or at least the broad strokes are, but no, I, I, things have felt over that span, I think, they fall into that rut you were talking about. And you can do that, you just have to do what soccer teams do. You have different lineups for different teams. Like, there's not you don't have to play your starters when you're doing a show in Albuquerque on television against Monday Night Raw. Uh, not Monday Night Raw. Uh, like, Monday Night Football. It's... They... And they when they do it, the shows are actually kind of better because they're not trying to fit 10 pounds of shit into a 5-pound bag. They're like, we have 10 pounds of shit and we can f put 5 pounds in this week and 5 pounds in next week. Yeah, and, and I, I to go back to Nakamura, I, I feel like he's just kind of gonna get stuck in that rut especially if he goes to raw I, i'm less concerned if he goes to smackdown but there's real potential for things to go he won't be a bust he's already not a bust that Sami Zayn match alone makes him not a bust but he's a real chance to make money for the company and to really expand their horizons and really change the way the business is run from an international perspective mm -hmm. and they're just kind of it seems like they're kind of afraid to pull the trigger because they also need him to be a demigod, and they kind of want to make him a human who's really good at wrestling. Right. So Because it's that fear of going out. It's that kind of post-rock fear of absolutely going all in on somebody. You know what I mean? Like, that, oh, well, we put we went all in on rock, and he left after we'd invested five you know years. You know, he was the star of the TV show for five years, and everything was about him. 
and then he left. So now we can't put that sincerity of promotional effort behind anybody. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you see it like in bits uh, and fits and starts, like with AJ Styles being the last week, everyone on earth being like, he's the best wrestler in the world. Yeah. You can see them do it. They change the way they talk about guys, but it's more of like the Bush administration talking about weapons of mass destruction and using the same lines over and over again than it is like an organic thing. It's also like you can just tell when, like, this was so the case with AJ Styles. You can tell when Vince McMahon is high on somebody, right? Because everybody talks <laughs> about them well, and suddenly they're being kept way better track of. Like, he saw, he was skeptical. He saw that first Roman Reigns match, and ever since then, how strong has AJ Styles been booked? Because he got over with Vince McMahon. But it, at the same time, it's like that, you know, um, this is a funny conversation between two only children here. But it's like it's like calling your parents and them talking about your siblings. Like some weeks, mom is high on your sister and low on you, and others other weeks, the you know she she thinks that your brother is good and your sister is lousy or whatever. It's like that fickle <laughs> like 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 I said, Vince McMahon just has that whatever. Who's who are his favorites this week? So it's you always feel happy when it's someone deserving who seems to be getting that attention, but you also can't help to be like, oh man, let's see how this lasts, and I hope the next guy who he gets infatuated with is half as good as AJ Styles, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I um, so I guess I'll just come out and say it. Nakamura can't win this match, right? It doesn't make sense for them going forward if he wins this match. No, I I think this is like kind of like the foot on the ropes kind of match where it's like. The, the the heel win, but not the super dirty heel win, just the like kind of Ric Flair, like beating beating the guy with the foot on the ropes win, I think. Yeah, and I think there's real value to that, especially if it's what pushes him out of the out the door. Because yeah, he needs exactly. to it's a good way to NXT. Exactly. It's a good way to get him out there without any damage. That's a finish that's a finish that anybody can lose that way and not lose anything. You know, it's it's well established for decades that when the guy puts his foot on the ropes, that unfair leverage is just is just insurmountable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, speaking of finishes, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about regarding the NXT TakeOver special? Um, no, nothing in particular. I mean, like, it's, it's like I said, they promoted it really as a three match card. And I think anything else that falls in, like I said, I'd love to see Ono and CN. I think that would just be like a nice little gift, maybe. Um, but it, it's really a three match card. And I think that. That those three matches are the perfect microcosm of NXT right now. You got Rude versus Nakamura, like I said, the match where they've kind of cooled Nakamura down with this NXT process, and then you also have Rude, who's the the TNA holdover. So that's sort of the what's maybe not working with NXT so well right now. Those two, you have Oscar and Ember Moon. What's working great? They have someone who's been consistently strong for a year, someone who's had a strong introduction and really been built well. And then you have DIY Revival and Authors of Pain, where this might be, as we alluded to throughout, kind of the swan song of these two great teams who've really, really been a huge part of all the TakeOver specials for the last calendar year in DIY and Revival. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a very good show. Uh, As usual, there's really never been a bad NXT TakeOver. Um, Yeah. So uh, you had some things you wanted to plug, so go ahead, because oh. this is the part of the show we're at. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Dave Writes Junk. That's at Dave, that's my first name, Writes, as in the thing you do with a pen, and Junk, as in the thing that is kept in the trunk. Uh, I write uh, weekly pieces for Russell Delphia. That's Russell, like the thing, the verb that... That and the verb that WWE superstars don't perform. Uh, so WrestleDelphia.com. Uh, we have a lot of great coverage, a fantastic team covering Raw, SmackDown, NXT, pay per views, the independent circuit, uh, great interviews and book reviews, uh, things of that nature. So check out WrestleDelphia.com. Follow me on Twitter at Dave Writes Junk. Um, I, I'm a little embarrassed to put this plug out there, but I will because I would. Blame myself later for not doing it on the platform. Uh, I also write some fiction, and I have a story coming out soon in uh, Mystery Weekly uh, called An Old Friend. It's uh, a mystery story. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter to learn more about that coming out, or you can follow Mystery Weekly as well. So follow me, follow WrestleDelphia, check out Mystery Weekly for my upcoming story. Yes, it's going to be awesome. I am... uh... A big fan of Dave's writing, and not just because we've been best friends for like ten years. <laughs> That's only no, like part, a small years. part. I Jeez, know it, it, we're so it, old. Holy yeah, it, 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 
freshman year of college is getting a really long time ago. It's pretty scary. <laughs> we'll always have Weezer pre-green. Um, exactly. Uh, Mark is at Mark underscore Normandon. That's Mark with the C. I am at the Nixter, T H E N one C K S T E R. That is the nine thousandth time I've gotten that correct, and Mark is not here to correct me. So <laughs> you can rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. Let's do. Uh... <laughs> I thought the guest was fine once they got to NXT. Boom, that's it. I thought the guest was fine once they got to NXT. That's your that review works. this week. Five stars. <laughs> oh yeah, we always get five stars, Dave. We're a five star company, um, and I guess if there's oh wait, you can also check us out at SoundCloud.com slash Rudo Radio. That's R U T O R A D I O. And I guess if there's nothing left to say, the only thing left to say is bye. <laughs>